After seeing the NHL lottery results, we now know that the Sabres own the first overall pick, with the Hurricanes and Canadians at 2-3. and three. Now knowing this, we can do a mock draft from 1-15 to 15 based on best fits for teams, what players they need, and who they will actually get. And we're going to talk about it next. Welcome back to Hockey Scouting Reports. I'm so glad you're here, so glad you're watching. And what I do here is every single day we talk about a specific prospect and we do a full uh, scouting report on them. So I have plenty of those on my channel if you haven't checked them out. I also do prospect comparisons. We just did one yesterday with Quinn Hughes and Adam Boquist. And I know that's a, a big interest for a lot of people, especially now going into a mock draft. That's something we really need to talk about. Which one of them is the best defender after Deline? Could it also be someone like Dobson or Bouchard? And we'll certainly get into that today. And so what I also do is I do deep looks at prospect pools. We've currently done the Sabres, the Canadians, and the Canucks. And so what that means is we'll have to continue to analyze those. The Hurricanes will have to be coming up very soon because obviously they now own the second overall pick. So certainly Hurricane fans, that will be coming. And I've also gotten some requests to do some other teams such as the Blackhawks and the Red Wings. And those will be coming as well. And you can expect these videos to be increasing as we get closer to the draft. And so now that we know what teams are lined up 1 through 15, we can do a mock draft. Now, I'm not a huge fan of mock drafts when people just throw in best player available. I don't think that's beneficial for those watching or reading. What I like to do with mock drafts, and the reason I haven't done one yet, is because I think we really need to wait and see who the order is to really understand what we're talking about. And so I think it's critical that now that we know 1 through 15, we can talk about who is going to go each pick. It's not just that, oh, Svechnikov is the second best player, he's going number two. Or Boquist is the best defender after Deline, he's going after Deline. That's not how it works. What we really have to talk about is how have these teams drafted in the past? Risk versus reward. What position do they need? And from there, can we decide which player they're going? Certainly some teams will pick the best player available, but if one team has a massive need at left wing, you have to imagine if there's a left wing close, they're picking it. Things like that. If one team absolutely does, despises Brady Kachuk, they're not going to pick him. So there's certainly things like that. And now that we know the full order 1 through 15, we can really make very strong educated guesses as to who's going to be picked and why. And some will certainly be uh, true when we see that in June. So let's get right into it. So if you disagree with any of this mock draft, feel free to disagree. Feel free to comment below. But I really think uh, the mock draft that I'm putting together is a very good one when we're talking about who these teams need and overall how would they fit in their system and when can they reach the NHL of course is also very important and then lastly before we get into this I'm not going to be talking about every single prospects projection comparison uh, skills stats we're not going to do all of that stuff we will do the stats a little bit but if you haven't seen any of that content I've done prospect reviews on every single prospect in this video that we're going to be talking about and I'm going to put links to those videos in the comments. Look for a pinned comment. There will be links to each of these scouting reports. So you can get a full 20 to 25 minute video on each of these. If you're a fan of a particular team and I'm thinking that player X is going to that team, feel free to check out that prospect report or watch it again to see how do you agree or disagree with what I'm talking about. So if there's content in this video that you think is missing in relation to each prospect, they are in other videos that you can check out, as well as comparison videos that I've made. So feel free to check those out. And lastly, before we really dive in, if you're new to the channel, I'm so glad you're here. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like, make sure to subscribe. And if you're returning, I'm so glad you subscribed, so glad you're watching, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. And in order to grow this channel, we just recently reached two, uh, 225 subscribers. I think we had 30 new subscribers yesterday alone, because obviously all this content with the lottery and that's fantastic. I'm so glad you guys are joining. It's really great to see this really moving on as this great source of hockey content for you guys. And so if you know anyone that's interested in this sort of content, feel free to share these videos. Feel free to, uh, you know, tell them about this channel. We're always looking to get more people involved. And I'm always interested in your comments. If you've noticed, whenever you comment, I'm always engaged with the comments. I'm always answering. So if you have any questions or any comments at all, I will definitely answer uh, all those comments. I'm always engaged there. So let's really dive right in. This is going to be very interesting, probably a 20-minute video. So the number one overall pick is the Sabres. Without being said, Rasmus Dahlin 
will be going to the Sabres, a generational defender. And I go over that in the video about Deline, as I do with all the other players, his particular skills. And so Deline, generational, excellent offensive talent, but excellent two-way threat as well. And so quickly looking over some specific stats that I want to highlight, some specific facets of his game that I want to highlight. 6'2", 183, good size, one of the best sizes four defenders in this draft, and that also plays into how good he is in this draft, knowing that he was in Boquist or 5'10", 5'11". Uh, also, looking at Deline, second year in the SHL, only 17, so he certainly had great experience at the professional level. He also played in the Olympics this year, as well as the World Juniors under 20. And so he played in Forlunda for the SHL, 41 games played, 7 goals, 13 assists, 20 points, 20 penalty minutes and a plus four. And so what we know about the SHL is they don't play younger kids. They play veterans. And when they play younger kids, they don't usually do well. We're talking one, four points, very low amounts. So to see him really thrive as a number one defender, 20 points, but then also that plus four, we see how strong he is offensively, defensively. And this really goes into his entire package. But he's also played so much more this year. In the Olympics, two games and one assist. We don't see young players playing in the Olympics. We saw Ely Tolvanen play in the Olympics this year. We don't see it. Very unlikely that younger players play. Now, of course, with the NHL not sending their players, this is something that we would see with younger guys hopping in. But obviously, with Deline being generational, you can expect he's going to get big moments, and he's learned how to play under pressure very well. Also, in the World Juniors, under 20, seven games played, six assists, no goals, six penalty minutes, and a plus seven. He truly highlighted how great of a playmaker he is. He can really drive the entire game because he has great vision, great skating, great hockey IQ, overall great plays with the stick, but he also knows how to get in the shooting lanes and the passing lanes and be this great defender overall. His comparison, and I talk about it more in his particular video, his comparison is a mixture of Eric Carlson and Nicholas Lindstrom. And I would argue both of those defenders, at least Lindstrom, are generational defenders. And you could also argue Eric Carlson is as well. So we have this elite offensive talent in Eric Carlson that Deline will be. But also this elite defensive talent who also was offensive in Nicholas Lindstrom, arguably one of the best defenders ever. And that's Deline. That's what we're talking about. Far better than Aaron Ekblad in 2014. Far better. And so locked in as the number one defender. And he will slot in next to Rasmus Ristolainen and almost immediately for the Buffalo Sabres next season. And so in second place is obviously the Carolina Hurricanes moved up from 11th to second in the lottery. What a big move up for them. What a big thing for their entire franchise. As we know, the Carolina Hurricanes have struggled in the past with keeping management, keeping owners, and of course, selling tickets. You have to imagine adding this great elite town at number two will really help them. Now, when we're talking about the Carolina Hurricanes, a lot of people are quick to say, oh, Andre Svechnikov is going number two because he's been the assumed number two overall pick. But I'm saying Philip Zadina is going number two, and we're going to talk about why. And it makes a lot of sense. So Philip Zadina, this year he played in the QMJHL for Halifax, of course, the same team that Nico Heischer came from, and Zadina put up 44 goals. Svechnikov put up 40 in the Barry Colts, but of course in much less games. Zadina, with those 44 goals, he amassed, well, first of all, he was the best sniper in the QMJHL, one of the highest points and the highest scoring rookie barely edging out Alexis Lafreniere. But also with Zadina is the fact that he played in the World Juniors seven goals, led the World Juniors in goals. Svechnikov had zero goals. Now, obviously, Russia does not ice younger players as much. That was a comment that someone made today. Zadina, of course, in a worse team with the Czech Republic, of course, he had a better opportunity to show his goal talent. But seven goals versus zero. As little ice time as Svechnikov got, he still got some. And to get zero goals is astonishing. But the reason I say the Hurricanes are getting Zadina, the true reason is that check and look at who Philip Zadina's center was in the World Juniors when he played seven games and he got seven goals. Who was this center? Well, it was Martin Nietzsche. Who was Martin Nietzsche? Well, he's the future number one or number two center for the Carolina Hurricanes. Drafted last year, very high, top 15, had a great job in the Czech Republic. He tied Casey Middlestat for the most points in the World Juniors this year. People don't like to say that. People like to say Middlestat won it. He was tied with Martin Nietzsche. Nietzsche is going to come in and be, he's compared to Jordan Stahl. He's going to come in and be a Jordan Stahl-like player right behind Stahl. He could take that number one very soon. And so you have to believe that chemistry is a massive thing in the hockey industry. The fact that Dadina hit seven goals 
as this very young threat, far better than Spetsnikov when Spetsnikov came in as this great sniper. Sadino's trying to prove who he is this year in his rookie Q year. He comes in, has great chemistry with Nietzsche, and the best duo in the entire World Juniors, you have to believe the, the Carolina Hurricanes want this to continue for the next decade. And so they're going to draft Philip Sedina at number two. And so for those of you that are Montreal Canadian fans and you're really hoping for Philip Sedina, you know, I hope it works out for you, but I really see Sedina going number two. And so what that means is for Montreal Canadian fans, you have to look also for other prospects to see if Sedina does go number two because he has this duo with Martin Nietzsche, which certainly needs to be mentioned. Who goes number three to the Canadians? Number three to the Canadians, a lot of people are going to say Svechnikov because he's this elite sniper who didn't go number two. But when we're looking at the Canadians, who they need, the answer is Brady Kachuk. Now, I know some people are not going to like this, but Brady Kachuk, first of all, he has center eligibility. We know that. He's played on the left wing, but he can also play on the center. And on the left wing, Montreal has been shaky. How is Gorchenyuk going to be? His contract ends in a few years. Where is he going? And so you could have this great elite physical agitator, chirper presence on the left wing, or do you shift him over to the center, knowing that after Druin, who is your center? Is it, you know, Philip Denault? He hasn't been amazing. Who is it going to be? And so we, when we look at Brady Kachuk, first of all, he's going to be NHL next year, just like Philip Zadina. And so you want to add in that NHL player immediately. We see Matthew Kachuk. We know how great he was for the Carolina Hurricanes. Matthew Kachuk says he's afraid of his brother. He says his brother is bigger and stronger and plays offensively better. That's exactly what you want. You know he's great in front of the net. He can ship pucks in front of the net. And we know the Canadians struggled with goal scoring this year. When you add in someone who can play in front of the net, screen for shots, make those goals happen, or chip in the goals, that's exactly what the Canadians need. Now looking at Brady Kachuk's stats, 31 games played in the NCAA for Boston, 8 goals in 40 games. 31 points, 40 games, 8 goals. That's very good for a rookie. You'd like to see more goals, but that's very good for a rookie. Came into the World Juniors, he was one of the best wingers, if not the best winger, for Team USA. Of course, Kyler Yamamoto could throw his name in there, but Brady Kachuk came in with fantastic points. Three goals, six assists for nine points in seven games. And so, what a great job he did. We look at Andrei Svechnikov, certainly less ice time, but he didn't even get one goal, and he only got five assists. Brady Kachuk beat him out in both categories, six assists, three goals. Sedina had one assist, whereas Kachuk has six. Of course, Sedina had seven goals, Kachuk had three, but this means that the Canadians would add one someone who's eligible to play center. He could be a number two center coming in immediately, or he could be a number two left wing coming in immediately. He's going to be a great physical threat, a great threat in front of the net, a great also defensive threat. He can have a great two-way game because of this physicality, because of this defense, because of this checking. You add in a physicality and a two-way threat, the Canadians are instantly a much better team than they were. You throw in Matthew Kachuk to Montreal, they're a much better team instantly. And so Brady Kachuk is going number three. If you're more interested in Kachuk, check out his scouting report. I go very much in depth on who he is, what his comparison is. Of course, his comparison is his brother. They're almost identical in play style. Number four is where it gets interesting. Svetsnikov still is off the board. But when we come to Ottawa, we know the story is that Ottawa doesn't have a ton of future talent. We know that Matthew Shane, his contract ends after next year. Who is this center that they have as a prospect? Well, they have Logan, uh, Logan Brown, and that is the only center prospect they have. But there's no a center that they can take at number four. And so who do they answer to? Who do they take? You could take the sniper in Svechnikov, but we know that Eric Carlson might be leaving Ottawa. And even if he doesn't, they don't have many other defenders. And so you have to take Adam Boquist. Adam Boquist is comparable is Eric Carlson almost identical. And so what that means is, especially in junior production, and so what that means is either A, Ottawa adds a defender just like Eric Carlson to be mentored by the real Eric Carlson, or they add someone like Adam Boquist who can replace Eric Carlson if he leaves. Either way, it's a great fit for them, and they add a defender who they massively need. And so Boquist, he has the most offensive upside in the entire draft for defenders, arguably as much, if not more, than Dolan. Or Deline, excuse me. That being said, Boquist, his defense is atrocious. It is terrible. He needs to work on that. And so he will not be NHL ready this season, unlike Zadina, unlike Achuk, unlike Deline. 
But Boquist has elite offensive talent. In fact, he has franchise offensive potential if he hits it. If you look at his super elite stats this year, as we know, super elite is the junior league behind the SHL in Sweden. Super elite, 25 games played, 24 points, along with 14 goals. And so Boquist is more of a goal scorer than Quinn Hughes. You could throw his name in there, of course. Boquist is more of an offensive talent in potential than Quinn Hughes. His defense is slightly less, and so his risk is higher, knowing that his defense is pretty bad. But that being said, we look at his playoff stats. The story is so much different. Three playoff games, five points with three assists, but then 29 penalty minutes. 29 penalty minutes in only three games. That shows how physical Boquist can be when he's playing under pressure. And so Boquist is going to be this great addition who can either play next to Eric Carlson or replace Eric Carlson in a year or two. And so what that means is when we're looking at number five, the fifth overall pick in the draft, well, that now falls to the Arizona Coyotes. Who do the Coyotes take? Well, you have to take Andre Svechnikov. Svechnikov is now still available as this elite sniper. Now, we'll, do we honestly think Svechnikov will remain on the board until five? As scary as that is, knowing that he has been this number two overall throughout the entire year, the fact that Carolina moved up, in my opinion, almost guarantees Adina goes to Carolina, knowing this Nietzsche's threat. We know that Montreal needs a center. The fact that they moved up, they can take a center that's eligible. Senators, they need to find some answer to this Eric Carlson thing. They need a defender. Boquist makes sense with this great elite potential. So Svechnikov really could remain at five, and the Coyotes are going to do a great job picking that up. And so Svechnikov is 6'3", 187. He adds such big threat to the Coyotes. We know that the Coyotes already have a working offense with Dylan Strome, who looks nice at the end. Of course, Clayton Keller throwing other guys like Christian Fisher. Defensively, with, of course, uh, Ekman Larson, they do have a decent core they're building around. Throwing Svechnikov, who is NHL ready, who will be NHL next season, this year in the Barry Colts OHL, 44 games played, 40 goals, 72 points. And so four less goals than Zadina in his Q year, but of course Q is more offensive. Svechnikov played less games. So Svechnikov has great offensive and sniping talent. His comparison, you could make the argument his comparison is someone like Patrick Laine, as you could say with Philip Zadina. But as I go over in Svechnikov's scouting report, I think the best comparison we can make for Svechnikov is Taylor Hall. And it's because Taylor Hall can still put up 35 goals, 39 even, but he also is a great playmaker. And Svechnikov is a great playmaker. We look in the playoffs, eight games played, five goals, six assists for 11 points. So certainly his playmaking is just as good as his goal scoring. We didn't necessarily see it in the regular season as much. We did see it in the World Juniors when he hit five assists. But we also see it in the playoffs. And so he's a great playmaker. You throw in a great sniper and a great playmaker next to Dylan Strom, who's a big center but struggles with his overall skating and his mentality and just his confidence. Throw in someone who has confidence, who has great mentality in his mind, great IQ, and can make sniping plays that's something that needs to happen. And of course, adding him to Clayton Keller would be a great addition. And so at six, the Red Wings are at six. Who do the Red Wings take? Well, the Red Wings need a defender. Of course, they could use a multiple of things, but when we look offensively, they don't have a bad core. We're not sure how much longer Zetterberg will be with them, but of course they have Larkin. And of course, with Larkin, they also have Evgeny Svechnikov, who in theory if Andrei Svechnikov is still available at five, you wonder if the Red Wings trade up to draft his brother, Evgeny's. It's very possible. But the Red Wings do have this core they're certainly building around. Defensively, they don't have nearly as much. And so when we look defensively at their depth chart this year, it's hard to say who their number one was. You could say it was the Kaiser Daily. Erickson was even getting up there. Cronwald, of course, there. This is an older defensive group. We look at their prospects. Certainly, they have a few, and I will make a uh, prospect video for them in a week or two. But when we're talking about Quinn Hughes, we cannot deny how strong he is offensively. Almost as good as Boquist, but of course, Boquist has higher potential. Hughes, this year, played for Michigan in the NCAA. 37 games played, 5 goals, 24 assists, 29 points. One of the best rookie seasons by a defender this year. Now, five goals, he's not much of a goal scorer, but that being said, he is a great playmaker. He has unbelievable skating, unbelievable IQ, unbelievable hockey sense, and all these things together really allow him to transition up the ice and have this excellent transition game, one of the best in this draft. And so he is also a very strong threat in his zone. Despite not being overly defensive, he can still do both ends for Detroit. He, I don't think he's NHL ready, Knowing that NCAA is a longer route for some people, 
But of course, we do see that Jack Eichel made that jump. Brady Kachuk's going to make that jump. Certainly, things happen. And so, Quinn Hughes could be NHL ready. It depends how the Red Wings want to handle him. But I think he'll be a great addition. Also, Quinn Hughes was selected to be in the World Cup team for USA. These prospects, most of them, if not all of them, have not been selected to the World Cup for their country, at least not yet. And of course, Deline, we're not sure, because Deline has commented that he wants to rest before the draft because he's done so much this year. But with Hughes being selected to the World Cup, whereas Dobson and Bouchard have not been, this is definitely huge for Hughes and huge for his development. And he's going to be this great offensive threat for the Red Wings. If you're interested in more about him, check out his scouting report in the comparison video I did yesterday with Edin Boquist. Certainly an excellent talent that the Red Wings should definitely add. We look at the Canucks next. Well, the Canucks sitting at 7th, so they didn't fall to ninth. But of course, the lottery did not help them again. The Red Wings need a defender. They need someone who can help Ole Levy, And they need someone who's NHL ready. Well, all three of those can be answered with Evan Bouchard. Bouchard might have the most offensive-ready defensive talent now. There's no defender coming into this draft after Deline who is offensive and ready. The Bouchard is the only other defender, in my opinion, who's NHL ready, and he will be NHL this fall. 90% sure that's going to happen. 6'2", 192, certainly good size, very physical. He plays a very physical game, but that being said, his offense is amazing. 67 games played, 87 points amazing. And so he can truly be this revolutionary force for them. He did not play in any internationals. He did not do U18, U20, or the World Cup. And so it's tougher to understand how is he going to transition because he hasn't played under pressure as much. But that being said, he did play in the London Knights. And so he also played with Ole Levy last year. And so what that means is he has this great chemistry already with Ole Levy. Which means when Ole Levy comes to Vancouver, most likely this season, this coming season, at some point, Bouchard could unlock a lot of potential with Ole Levy and be this great threat with him. And when we talk about Bouchard, one of the biggest things to mention is how cerebral of a defender he is. And as we know, Ole Levy was drafted to be this great cerebral defender. Bouchard can answer that and be this Ole Levy 2.0, who adds great offensive talent, but this great puck moving cerebral transitional kind of defender mentality and then of course uh, Ulevi can shore up the back end so it could be this great combination that they need to have and so after Bouchard where do we go well of course the Blackhawks are up next and so the Blackhawks they're looking for a sniper in my opinion of course they have uh, Alex Debrinkit who's been this great uh, sniper for them getting these cat tricks as they call them doing a great job for them. Of course, they have Patrick Kane, this great playmaker, both on the right wing. But I think if we can add a third wing to this team, even a third right winger, or someone who can shift to the other side, you have to do it. And it's Oliver Wallstrom. Oliver Wallstrom, 60 games played in the USDP. As we know, the USDP does a great job developing players. Austin Matthews played there. Jack Hughes is playing there, the expected number one next year. As we know, Joe Farabee is playing there. Quinn Hughes played there. Bodie Wild played there. All these names we recognize, all these names are very talented. And so, Wallstrom this year played their top line with Farabee and Hughes. 60 games played, 47 goals, 45 assists, 92 points. One of the best, if not the best, offensive threats in that team. Of course, playing with Farabee and Hughes certainly elevates his game. But nonetheless, 47 goals is amazing. Going to Harvard in the fall, he's certainly going to have a chance to develop at a good hockey school. And... You know that the USDP creates these uh, overall goal scorers. We've seen how great of a goal scorer Austin Matthews is. And so Wallstrom is really going to come in either as the third or second LW, or uh, uh, RW, excuse me, or play on the uh, left wing. And so he's really going to revolutionize what the Blackhawks are playing with. He's going to make the game faster. That's one of the big things we need to talk about. The Blackhawks are not playing a fast enough game. Whether that's Jonathan uh, Taves, whether that's Patrick Kane getting a little bit older, Whatever it is, they're playing a slower game. Defensively, we know someone like Duncan Keith. He is getting older, but he certainly is very talented. They need to keep the game fast. And Oliver Wallstrom is extremely fast. Great skating, great vision, great hockey IQ, unbelievable hands, soft hands. And all of this allows him to transition the game so well offensively and put up great snipes. And like I said, 47 goals this year. That could be with the Blackhawks next year, and it has to happen for them. And so after the Blackhawks, the Rangers come up next. And so the Rangers, of course, they just moved Ryan McDonough 
at the deadline. And of course, center-wise, they have Leas Anderson. They have Philip Heathel. They don't necessarily need a center. They need defense. And so you have to go best defender available. In my opinion, it's Noah Dobson. And so Noah Dobson is this great defensive defender that they can add, arguably the best defensive shutdown defender in this draft. Of course, he's playing in the QMJHL for the Titan. And nonetheless, he has been phenomenal. As we know, defensively, the Q, it's very tough to build defensive defenders that are mainly offensive. And so when we see one that is so good defensively, it's exactly something that we need to talk about. And so Dobson, 6'3", 179, 67 games played, 69 points, 52 assists. And so his offensive game is certainly there, but we are talking about the Q, which is a uh, very offensive league. But that being said, he does have playmaking talents. We look in the playoffs, though, you can see his offense isn't as good as someone like Bouchard, who thrived in the playoffs. Whereas someone like Dobson, 9 points in 14 games in the playoffs. Not bad, but when we talk about how offensive that league is, that might only be like 6 or 7 points in a different league anymore, uh, defensive league. But that being said, Dobson is this great shutdown defender, gets in the passing lanes, gets in the shooting lanes, great checker, uses his size, 6'3", 179, the most size of all defenders in this draft. What a great talent he is. Now, he has not played at the international level for U18, U20, or the World Cup. And so what that means is he may not be as developed under pressure, which is something that we need to talk about with defenders. But when we're talking about the Rangers, they need to add someone who can shore up the back end and play on the two-way side offensively when needed. Dobson can be that exact threat for them. And so after Dobson, we go to the Oilers. The Oilers, it's a tough call who you take with the Oilers. In my opinion, they go best player available. The Oilers need one of two things. They need either a defender, because their defense, even with Adam Larson, it's been very questionable. Knowing how Taylor Hall has been, I doubt anyone wants Adam Larson if they could have kept Taylor Hall instead of making that trade. Defense needs to be shored up. They got guys like Clefbaum, Bear, you know, of course, they have young guys, but is it clicking? So you could say, go defender. But at this point, there's no defender who really sticks out of my mind who could go 10th. Certainly, you can make a bit of a reach, but I think at 10th, you have to pick best player available. Their other need is a winger, particularly a left winger, and Joel Farabee is exactly that. We look on the right wing in Edmonton. Who do they have? Well, of course, Yamamoto. Next year, of course, Poyarvi. They have plenty of players. Strom has played on the right wing, even. Dreisland has played on the right wing. Slepachev. We look on the left wing. Who do they have? Well, Lukic has not been that good. He's been relegated to the third line at the end of the season. Ryan Nugent Hopkins was forced to play at the one left wing in order to see if something can work, and it has worked. But if they get rid of Nugent or they put him back to the three center, they have to add someone who can play on the left wing. Even if they keep RNH at, at uh, one left wing, they have to add someone. And so Joel Farabee is exactly that. Farabee, like I said, he played on the left wing to Jack Hughes and Oliver Wallstrom. So certainly he was helped with those two, but that being said, he was the captain of the USDP team, great leader, great presence, works hard every game, one of the hardest workers this draft, but the big story is he is the best two-way forward this draft, not counting centers, the best two-way winger this draft. We know that Edmonton struggles defensively, and so if we can find an answer to both of these questions, how do we help their defense, how do we help their left wing, Therapy is this answer. He can be great on the power, pl on the pow on the power play or the penalty kill, great on either ones. His stats this year, 60 games played, 33 goals, 41 assists, for 74 points. And so he can be this great offensive threat on the power play on the 5 on 5. He is extremely fast. And so that speed, he should be able to play with Connor McDavid and Yamamoto. Many players can't play with Connor McDavid. Poyari hasn't seemed to show that yet. But also, Farabee can play on the penalty kill, as he always does, as he's this great two way threat. And that'll be great for them. And so next is two Islanders picks. And so the Islanders, the story with them is Jonathan Tavares. Where's Tavares going? Is he going to resign with them? And so there's so much risk involved. And so if the Islanders can A, pick up a center in case Tavares goes, or B, pick up a center to show that we don't necessarily need to keep Tavares, that could be something very worthwhile for them. And nothing sticks out to me more than Joe Valeno. Joe Valeno was given exceptional status, just like Tavares was. Now, Joe Valeno has been very controversial, and how has he done with this exceptional status? Of course, his rookie year was fantastic, but he hasn't built on it since. 6'1", 194, he has a great build to be a center. You put him behind Barzo, he can be this great center. Now, if they're keeping Tavares, it's going to be tougher having three centers down the middle. Absolutely, that'd be great. But 
if they're keeping Tavares, they could look at other options. But this, of course, will give them a great option to go to if Tavares is leaving, and you have to think they're going Valeno. I think more assured than almost any other pick in this draft is the Islanders going Valeno if he's available. And this year, he was traded mid-season. Of course, once he was traded, before, before he was traded, he was a point per game, 31 points. When he was traded, 33 games, 16 goals, and then he finished up with 48 points with 33 assists. And so also plus 14. And so he's been this great offensive talent when he was traded. That might be the exact talent that was the reason he got exceptional status. So he certainly showed at the end and in the playoffs how strong he was. In the playoffs, 10 games played, 5 goals, 6 assists for 11 points. He's showing he can do it. He's showing he can do it under pressure. He's showing this trade wasn't just a quick thing in the dust. He can do it. And so Valeno should go to the Islanders to either replace or make the transition and the overall answer easier about the Tavares issue. And so the Islanders also, once again, they have the next pick at 12, back-to-back. In my opinion, they need to get a defender. Their defense certainly has been decent. We see guys like Letty leading it up. Of course, they have uh, a bunch of other guys. When we look overall at their uh, depth chart defensively, we see someone like Dennis Seidenberg being the number two defender for them this year. Of course, Sebastian Ajo, the other Ajo, came in and played as this younger defender. Of course, Pollock also played decently on the power play. But you have to think if they can add a defender, they're going to add one, especially if it's an offensive defender, which they could desperately use. And so the answer to this is Ty Smith. And so Ty Smith, one of the best offensive defenders in this draft based on stats alone, not as good as Evan Bouchard. He does have some other issues. 5'10", 170, certainly small. He's about as big as Quinn Hughes. That being said, he's an elite skater, probably the best skater for defenders this draft after Deline, or at least one of the best defensive skaters. Great skating and a great worker. And as we know, great skating, great worker, you can transition and become a great player just based on that alone. Now, of course, he played in Spokane, which means he played on the power play and the 5 on 5 with Kyler Yamamoto, and of course, Anderson Dolan. And so that definitely helped in his overall offensive uh, stats. But that being said, 69 games played. 59 assists, 73 points. He's a great playmaker. Not much of a goal scorer, as we've seen. He only got four goals. Or excuse me, uh, not four goals. But um, that being said, with 60, uh, with 59 assists, what a great playmaker Ty Smith is. And when you add this great playmaker to the Islanders, who, why haven't they made the playoffs? Certainly this Tavares issue is tough for them, but they need more points from the back end. We know Bartles did a great job up front. We know Bailey did a great job up front. Of course, Tavares did. They need someone to shore up the back end offensively. Can Letty be that long term? He is getting older, and I think you have to add Ty Smith to do that long term. Next, we're going to, after that, we're going to the Stars. And so the Stars, the story with the Stars is how are they down the middle? As we know, Martin Hansel injured, big contract, older player, hasn't shown to be that good uh, stat-wise besides being a physical kind of fourth-line center. And so do they really want to keep him long term? Aside from that, they also have Jason Spezza. Getting older, not doing that well offensively, contract ending soon, how is that going to be answered? Then, of course, Roddick Foxa. Foxa, when he's gotten more minutes, he's played better. But he doesn't have the overall skills to be a two-center, mainly a three-center, because he does have two-way physicality. And his stats, his offensive stats, aren't amazing, but certainly they're decent. He could, in theory, be a number two center. But that being said, the Stars should definitely add someone behind Tyler Sagan. They can add Barrett Hayden. Barrett Hayden is the best defensive and two-way center this draft. And so Hayden, he uh, overall is this great two-way threat. And so 6'1", 185, good size for his overall game. And when we look at uh, breaking down his stats in the OHL, 63 games played, 21 goals, 39 assists for 60 points, slightly below point per game. When he comes into the NHL, we're expecting 40 to 50 points, maybe 10 to 20 goals. So not a great offensive talent, but we're going to see plenty of time on the penalty kill. He'll put up some physicality, some penalty minutes, but he's also going to be great in the plus minus category this year, OHL plus 24. Not everyone is a fan of the plus minus stat for more reasons than one, but it certainly does show that they're a positive force on the ice in different situations. Barrett Hayden has been that. He's going to be a great center for the stars. You put him right behind Sagan, that is the answer. That allows Faxa to be that three center like he's been comfortable with. That allows them to keep Hanzo or Spezza at the four and have a better answer long-term 
up front. We know Taylor Sagan is not under contract for much longer, so either way, they need to find someone, because eventually he becomes a UFA. They need to find someone with FAXA. Hayden is the answer. And so after Hayden is the Flyers. The Flyers, of course, if they won the lottery, their pick most likely would have went to the Blues, because of course the Blues could have opted to take it. And so by staying at 14, they have the option of adding really anyone available. I think you have to go defender. In fact, the next two picks, I think you have to be defenders. There's certainly offensive players, but this draft is a defender draft. And so there's many talented defenders. You have to take them when you can. And so I think Bodie Wild is the answer. Bodie Wild is the best checking and hitting defender this draft. No one's going to lay a hit harder. We talk about defenders who lay the best hits in the NHL. Two names that come to mind, Dustin Bufflin, who does probably the best hits overall, but uh, Nicholas Cronwall, who throughout his entire career has been this excellent checker, this excellent physical threat. And so you add in Bodie Wild, whose comparison is Nicholas Cronwall. He can certainly be this great physical threat for them. 6'2", 196, exactly what they need in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, of course, has Ivan Provorov. Of course, they have Shangle de Gossespierre. But they have to add someone into that 3-6, to six, mainly 3-4 to four defensive grouping that can be a physical shutdown threat. And that's going to add so much more to them to keep them a playoff team, and especially one of the younger playoff teams, keeping them talented. And so Bodie Wild this year played in the USDP. So he was mainly playing as a defender on the ice while Therabee, Wallstrom, and Hughes were. So, of course, he was helped by them, but, of course, he also helped them. He's also uh, 59 games played, 12 goals, 29 assists, 41 points. So not overly offensive, as we've seen, but his defensive game needs to be mentioned, especially the physicality, 63 penalty minutes in 59 games. He's going to be a great physical threat for them. Is it a slight reach at this point? I don't think so. I think he's going to go at 14. He also is going to the University of Michigan in the fall, which means he's going to play. If Quinn Hughes stays in Michigan for a season, which he very likely will, Bodie Wilde will get a chance to reunite with Quinn Hughes and develop alongside him and really gain in his developments, gain in his confidence, and hopefully build his offensive talent more. And so the last pick out of the top 15, which I want to talk about in this mock draft, because we know the top 15, who do the Florida Panthers take? The Florida Panthers, we look at their depth chart, they don't need a center. Down the middle, they have Barkov, they have Trocek, and now they have Henrik Borgstrom, who's coming from the NCAA, played a few games, did a decent job. Who do they add? They have to add a defender, in my opinion. Keith Yandel, Aaron Eckblad. Keith Yandel has been an amazing offensive defender for them. Career year for him. He struggled in his career, but since coming to Florida, he's been this great offensive number one defender. Aaron Eckblad has concussion issues, but when he doesn't, he's still a very good offensive defender. In fact, he had a great season this year, statistically. After that, though, who do they go defensively? Who do they have? Well, of course, they have Mike Matheson, but after that, who else do they have? Add in a defensive defender who has great potential but may not reach it. That's what they need, and that's Jeremy Kaizek. Jeremy Kaizek is someone that we often forget. He's playing in Halifax. He's playing with uh, Zadina and Gru, who are playing offensively, McIsaac is their number one defender. And we often forget about him. The 2016 QMJHL entry draft, we know that uh, Benoit Olivier Gru, he went first overall, but number two overall to Halifax again was Jared McIsaac. And when he was picked, he was considered to have unbelievable offensive and defensive potential. He was considered to be the number one or number two overall pick in this draft two years ago before Rasmus Dahlin really got on the map as this great player. Of course, Svetsnikov was known for a few years as well. And so McIsaac has had this great potential. Certainly he's falling much as Valeno, but nonetheless, it's untapped potential that needs to be picked. Certainly there's a high risk in the fact that we look at his offensive stats this year, 65 games played, only 9 goals, 38 assists, 47 points. There's a risk. His offensive game is not that strong. And so how do you go from there? But knowing he's 6'1", 194, he is this great physical threat. Great physical threat. In fact, one of the best physical defenders this draft. We just talked about Bodie Wild. We look at McIsaac, 86 penalty minutes this year, but also a plus 14 on the ice. He's been a positive force two-way, positive force defensively, but a great checker, great mentality, and he has untapped offensive potential. And when Zadina leaves Halifax and goes to the NHL next year, a lot of the situation is going to be put on McIsaac and put on Gru. And so if these guys can really perform at a higher level, they're going to really reach their potential. And that's exactly what the Florida Panthers need, a shutdown defender 
who has potential, who could be more. It could be a very big steal of a pick for them. And even if it's not, the guys that can be a decent two-way defensive threat. So thank you guys for watching. That was the mock draft 1 through 15. I know some of these picks are not what you're going to see on mock drafts online. I'm not going and copying other mock drafts. What I'm doing here is I'm really focusing on the best fit and who do I think these teams will actually pick. We know that some teams often like to pick risk over reward. We look at the Carolina Hurricanes. They picked Julian Gother just a few years ago. That was a risk of a pick for sure. His defense was not really considered to be there. His skating wasn't considered to be there. And he kind of struggled in the AHL this year. Martin Nietzsche was a risk of a pick because no one really knew about him. He wasn't really on the map, especially playing in the Czech League. And so you have to think, knowing that Carolina likes to take these risks, knowing high potential, Tadino could very likely be in their realm. So thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the content, make sure to hit the thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't for more content. Like I said, we do this every single day. Different scouting report videos. I'm always open to suggestions, so if you have any suggestions on what videos I should be focusing on next, feel free to comment them below. And like I said, I'm always answering questions, comments, anything. I'm always there for that. So thank you guys for watching. I'm so glad you're watching. And like I said, make sure to uh, subscribe, of course, but also share this with other people who could like this content. And then lastly, uh, check out my Twitter. It's at HockeyLevine using the hashtag HockeyLevineTalk. And so what I do there is I do quick comments about prospects that I don't have enough time to do a full video on, or there isn't enough content to do a full video on. But nonetheless, they are worth mentioning. In fact, in Twitter just a couple weeks ago, I talked about a winger from the United Kingdom, which might get on the map as a fifth or sixth round pick because he has great potential, but he's only playing in England. And so how does that uh, bode for him? And so if you want to check that out, feel free to check out my Twitter at Hockey Levine using the hashtag Hockey Levine Talk. So thank you guys for watching. So glad you're watching. And I'll see you guys in the comments and in the next video.